And I'm happy to talk once again to David Graeber. David is an anthropologist. He is a writer. He is an activist and many other things as well. Uh, uh, he's a professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics. He's the author of the book Debt, D-E-B-T, -E Debt, the first 5,000 years. He's very been very involved in the global justice movement and in the founding and execution of the Occupy movement and his most recent book uh, title, which uh, Troy will have to bleep out, but I will say it is Bull <laughs> Jobs, a Theory, and there's a lot I wanted to talk to David about. So first of all, David, thanks for coming back. Well, thanks so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Now, here's what I wanted to talk to you about, and, and we'll get... We'll go every, anywhere we want to, but, but I've been thinking a lot about the fact that in American politics right now, and particularly on the liberal side of the spectrum, I hesitate to call it the left because I think that, you know, mm -hmm. they're two very different phenomena, but the, uh, there seems to be... In France, a, they call it the extreme center. The extreme, uh, Tarek Ali has a book by that name, and I, I use that phrase myself years ago, so... Um, I guess I would say that there is a, a, a tension between what a friend of mine calls candidate addiction and this over-identification with uh, political figures as kind of superheroes or dress-up, you know, uh, dolls or whatever. Uh, and I'm being overly disparaging, but maybe not too disparaging. And... Um, and the notion that what we real where I come down that I wish people would take their emotional attachment and affix it to movements and rather than personalities and, and kind of step away from this personality driven politics. Now you're based in in London now, but you're from the states. Uh, I know it's a huge problem here in the U.S. Uh, I don't know the state of that in London, in uh, in the UK. It doesn't seem to be as bad a problem. But I guess you know you'd written a couple pieces that that seem to touch on that. One was the book you co-authored on kings. Another was a piece you wrote years ago on superheroes. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we? Uh, what do you think about that whole topic of personality-driven uh, mm -hmm. politics? Well, the irony is it's fundamentally anti-democratic, at least if you look at it in deep historical terms. Um, you know, generally speaking, the idea of charismatic figures who are trying to like engage in all sorts of impressive contests and who you know everything about their personal lives and who's um, trying to sort of like gather together followers against each other. That's called aristocracy. You know, that's the way the Homeric epics work, or most epics actually. You know, Vikings operated that way. But it wasn't a democratic thing. I mean, traditionally, for example, even voting was not considered particularly democratic because it was all about a bunch of guys who considered themselves the superstars, the best, Aristo means best, um, you know, trying to determine which one was best of all by who would, who would vote for them. Whereas um, dem democracies actually practice sortition. They chose people by random lottery so as to avoid any possibility of that kind of cult of, of personality. So, so it's really undemocratic tradition, but it seems to have taken over increasingly a lot of the countries that continue to call themselves democratic, although increasingly on, on less and less it's less and less clear what that's actually supposed to mean. Um, yeah, in, here in the UK, there's a real move against that. And and people talk about it as the Corbyn phenomena and try to identify it with a, a single personality. But of course, one reason why Corbyn is so popular is that he didn't even want to be nominated as party leader to begin with. Uh, he's a guy who um, was sort of dragooned into it by uh, you know, since all the other left wing candidates had already done it once. And um, and everybody can tell he's like this nice guy who didn't really want this job, who's trying to do his best at it. He's a kind of anti politics figure in that regard. Um, and but he represents a movement to try to replace the sort of personality based politics with with. A movement-based idea. I mean, the Labour Party started as a social movement-based party. So he's trying to turn the Labour Party back into one where it's really a kind of a movement. Thousands of people have been drawn in. At this point, it has half a million members. Um, it's, I think it might be the largest party in Europe as a result. Um, 
And there's a huge tension because the entire apparatus of the media, of, of the political structure as it exists, is based around personalities, which is also very convenient for journalists because if you're studying a social movement, a, 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 if you have a democratized party where they're talking about issues, covering that's a lot more work. You have to be a real reporter. Whereas, you know, in, in the in the personality-based system, well, it's easy. You just sit around and muse about people's personalities. That's kind of fun. And you get to be a personality yourself for doing it well enough. Um, so, so the media and, and the political class have reacted very, very violently against this attempt to move back to a much more grassroots democratic model of politics by incessantly attacking Corbyn's personality. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, I, I've been shocked, I do follow the British press, I've been shocked at, uh, if that's not an oxymoron, a, and I, I find myself absolutely uh, blown away by the intensity of the personal attacks against Corbyn, which, we can, get, we, which we can get to also, but, you know, I it, thought I'm and I, this is like way, way worse. Yeah, uh, I think there's an analog between Corbyn as a figure and Bernie Sanders as a figure mm -hmm. in this country, because while Bernie did, in fact, put himself forward as a nominee for president, and I worked for him, I was, you know, employee mm -hmm. number five or something on his campaign, uh, so I worked with him, uh, he never, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, never anticipated actually being president. When he started, he did it to, you know, elevate yeah. issues in a movement, and then it, it, it took on like a, the same, yeah. yeah, so there's a Corbin analog there and that I think a lot of people were drawn to Bernie. People kept saying, why are young people drawn to this guy in his 70s? I think it was because like Corbin, he seemed like an anti-candidate. He seemed like someone who didn't buy into the, 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 the BS about uh, personality-driven politics. And it mm. made him attractive to people in the same way. And I think drew the same intensity of attack uh, as a result from the media, from economists yeah. like Paul Krugman, from 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 other, you know, people in positions of authority, from other politicians. And I wonder, you know, I've, I've thought about this. Uh, I'm not an anthropologist as you are, but I've thought about it, uh, certainly the Sanders phenomenon, uh, in anthropological terms, I've wondered whether, you know, it almost felt like these 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 figures of Corbyn and Sanders were violating some uh, cultural a uh, norm of some kind and were, you know, receiving the punish, collective punishment of, of society, of that subset of society. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, the political class. They're violating the basic tenet of the political class, which is that this is not about issues. This is about game playing, because especially the media, like, you know, the mainstream media wants it to be about game playing because it's all about them then. They're the referees in a contest. Um, and it gives them enormous personal power as well. A lot of these guys who just sort of sit around sitting, you know, sitting in judgment over other people's performance in this game whose rules are partially responsible for making up. And if you say, no, we want to totally switch the game, that's a real threat. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And as you were alluding to earlier, suddenly their skill set in the media in particular, but also in politics, of manipulating personalities and horse race stories in order to, to achieve a di desired outcome, whether it's increased viewership or whether it's a, a, a victory in an election, suddenly this entire class's mode of uh, perpetuating its own set of BS jobs is, is in danger, right? Their, their livelihood, yeah, so. And that uh, idea of game playing, this is very interesting actually, has spread. I mean, it, it used to be that only people, you know, if you look at the front page or like you know, movies from the from the 40s, it was newspaper men were supposed to be incredibly cynical. They looked at the world as a sort of constant game. All politics is really a cynical game, but nobody else felt that way. Gradually, they there's it's that that sort of attitude has been disseminating, so that everybody's supposed to see things that way, um, which is, it's actually really interesting I, I, because it creates a, a kind of a different form of ideology. Um, it used to be, you know, kind of sort of classic definitions of ideology are that, you know, they trick you into thinking that the system is fair, even though you're really getting screwed over in one way or another. Uh, but actually, nobody really thinks the system is fair. Um, everybody's you know, insofar as they're tricking you nowadays, they're tricking you into thinking everybody else thinks the system is fair. You know, you see through it, you're the cynical realist, but everybody else is sheep and stupid. And everybody's thinking that of each other. And 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 
you know, I call it the financialization of politics because Keynes was famous asking in the 30s about the beauty contest. He said, you know, financial markets are a little bit like a beauty contest where everybody's asked to guess who everybody else thinks is the most beautiful. You know, so, 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 <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, great, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So so you're all saying, well, I think that, you know, I like that one, but I think people go for her because, you know. um, Right. Right. And, 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 but then you like double think it because then you realize everybody else is trying to figure out what everybody else thinks is the most beautiful. And you can do that two, three, four times if you want to. Um, it goes on forever. Uh, and, and in a way, that's what we're doing to candidates now. I mean, with Corbyn, like before he actually, you know, got to run and, and, and when you act, UK, the they have to give you equal time. So suddenly he just shot up 20 points in the polls when people saw what he exactly like. But but before that, pretty much everybody had the same line. You just saw it over and over again. You saw people say, well, you know, he talks a lot of sense. I kind of like his positions. Um, I mean, some of his most radical positions were positions that actually mo- overwhelmingly people agreed with, like renationalizing the rails. I think a majority of Tories agreed with that, um, although it was always, you know, um, presented as crazy in the press. Uh, but, but you know, people would say, oh, well, of course I agree with his positions, but nobody's going to vote for that guy. He's unelectable. This right, is a word that right. didn't exist in the human language, you know, 20 years ago, unelectable. Uh, so, so, so basically it's the same thing. It's like the beauty contest effect. Everybody's saying like, you know, well, I'm trying to guess what everybody else thinks uh, is going to be an electable candidate. So there's no point in voting my and throwing my voter away about somebody who nobody else is going to vote for. But of course, everybody's thinking that. Right. Right. No, I, I've actually thought about writing about exactly that, because that seems to be in American politics, a uniquely Democratic Party phenomenon that voters are expected to game out the beauty contest at all instead of voting for the candidate that most closely reflects uh, their yeah. views. Uh, Corbyn it, showed us how ridiculous that was because once the guy managed to get through, he did way better than the centrists. Yeah, well, of course, here in the United States, we're seeing that uh, the policy of Medicare for all is doing much, much better than uh, is up to 70% approval, I think, among Democrats now, majority approval overall. I may be even understating the figures. Uh, when we were all told that wasn't uh, politically possible. And then there's this a- attempt, I think, to uh, I think we, we're seeing a multi-stage process here. And the first was expel these heretics, right? And uh, the second, at least in the States, I, I don't see this happening in the UK yet, but it's a kind of, I'll tell you a story. When I was young, still a teenager, I got involved in kind of like pre-punk music, you know, destroy mm-hmm. the corporate state, you know, no songs longer than two and a half minutes, you know, F all the record company. Right? Yeah, in the 70s. <laughs> and um, I remember my uncle, who I loved very much, who was an amazing guy, but was in show business in New York City, he said, that's a great bit you kids have got. And I said, you know, uncle, it's not a bit. It's like what, what we believe, don't call it a bit, you know, that's a show business term for like a gag or whatever, an act. He says, oh, oh you're saying you believe it? That's a great bit too. And <laughs> it's just like that Bill Hicks skit, sketch. It, Remember that one? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, I yeah, did, the anger dollar. That's a really good one. <laughs> right, right. You're right. I <laughs> forgot that. And, you know, I feel as if now in the U.S. there's a little bit now in the Democratic Party of that. Let's let's take that bit. That bit works. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are endorsing Medicare for all presidential candidates and so on that I think would never, uh, you know, try to implement it. But at least it shows how far the needle has moved. But with Corbyn. I think we're still in this stage of what they were doing uh, to Bernie a couple years ago, and will probably do if he runs again, which is, for example, with Bernie, they made the false claim that relative to Hillary, he was a racist, um, which was preposterous given the Clintons yeah, and Hillary. Yeah, they couldn't use anti-Semitism against him because he's Right. Jewish. With Corbyn, <laughs> it's anti-Semitism, even though there's much more documentable as far as I can tell, anti-Semitism uh, uh, in among the Tories, but oh yeah, um, and certainly the Tories that I knew when I lived in the UK just sort of dripped that sort of uh, patrician. Oh, well, you want, yeah, you do want me to talk about that? Like, let me tell you. Um, I mean, well, polls show that Tories are more anti-Semitic in general than Labour um, voters, but you know, the thing is that you don't hear it so much from the Tories because nobody who doesn't have media training ever gets anywhere near a microphone. Whereas with labor, they're trying to democratize the party. So this whole thing is actually kind of clever because, okay, the Blairites' big argument, Blairites being the sort of 
centrist, basically right. the right wing of the Democratic Party. Um, so, so the Blairite argument had always been, well, we can win elections. You're a crazy extremist. Nobody will vote for you. When that fell through, and it was clearly not true because, you know, Corbyn did way better than any Blairite candidate had since actually the first time Blair voted actually, ran, actually. Um, and some, by some arguments, even better. Um, all right. So, so they couldn't say that anymore. What do they have left? You know, if you've already sold your principles for, for to be electable and you're not even electable, what do you got left? So they kind of came and they've been trying to throw every smear they could possibly think of at him for, for two years, I mean, pretty much openly. Um, so finally they figured out one that would work because they said, if we call, first of all, it's the Karl Rove thing, right? Attack your enemy's strengths. Everybody knows he's a decent guy. He's anti-racist. He's principled. So let's call him racist anti-Semite. But, but the reason it's clever is, first of all, it's a way of attacking the democratization of the party. Because anti-Semitism is quite ripe here. I mean, I, I grew up in New York city and i'm jewish and you know so i never heard this kind of stuff i mean i thought right. anti-semitism right. was a kind of paranoid fantasy that people like woody allen had that people you know still thought that way and you know here i am coming to a place where you hear people make anti-semitic remarks all the time nobody knows i'm jewish so i just hear it all the time and and you know but the thing is you know you can't get rid of something like that except by bringing it out in the open and confronting it which in a way is what the labor party at least is doing you know because as i when they try to democratize you know, everybody gets the microphone, not just people who have media training. And a lot of them say offensive and obnoxious things. And But, you know, then it, once it's out in the open, you can address it. Now, they're seizing on that is because, of course, the Blairites are terrified of the, uh, the democratization of the party because they have the system here. There's no primaries, right? So, so if you're an MP, you get to stay an MP for the rest of your life. You're automatically the candidate. Um, so they can't get rid of some of these guys. They were put in under Blair. All of their constituents hate them. But, you know, th there's no way they can, like, get them out of there except for a very elaborate process. They're trying to change that, and that's one of the focuses of democratization. These guys were panicking. So what they do is, okay, you know, if we use anti-Semitism, A – like uh, it's a way of attacking the democratization because you know when you have democracy people say this offensive stuff so you say look look what's happening and 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 second of all it's perfect because you can't respond to it because even though these guys who are, who are eating the charges mostly very few of them are actually jewish themselves so it's you know it's, it's basically a blairite conspiracy but the moment anybody says oh it's a conspiracy they can say aha aha look see you believe in jewish conspiracy that shows it's true right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, yeah, it is very clever. I've seen it, and it's been frustrating to watch because it's been rather well executed. But it seemed to me that both, uh, and uh, you know, I'm Jewish as well. Uh, although I had family on in both religions, was also yeah, spent, too, right? some, spent some so. childhood in Southern Baptist environment too. But but um, but I'm Jewish, and uh, you know, it, it struck me that what they were doing was. Um, was and this is pivotal now, I think, in intra-democratic party fights, is posing the idea that, quote-unquote, identity politics, that is, poli poli mm -hmm. politics that seeks justice based on racial or ethnic identity, and mm -hmm. class-based politics, yeah. structural mm -hmm. politics, are in absolute opposition. And yes. therefore, if you are on the economic access, axis politically, you must be... Uh, hostile to the rights and needs of of ethnic groups and, and racial groups and vice versa. And it seems to me this is a very convenient uh, apposition to create if you want to really uh, keep economic control and political control exactly where it's been. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and it's, in America, it's getting worse and worse. I mean, and, and the irony is it's actually playing into the hands of the right um, in, in, in a thousand different ways. But like it, to go back to the case of the UK, the anti-Semitism thing, I mean, this is the first – I have a lot of Jewish friends who say this is the first time I've actually felt endangered and threatened – you know, not by the Labor Party at all, they're all members, uh, but rather, you know, because – Getting in people's minds that, you know, Jewish people are a group that's like will rise up in outrage and cry anti-Semitism if somebody like disagrees over the wording of an example and anti-Semitism, you know, uh, that's 
one of the big issues here. Um, you know, right. over time, um, you know, at the same moment as you have fascists actually organizing, you know, people who actually are anti-Semitic and actually want to kill Jews, um, you know, they exist. They're, they're gathering force everywhere. Who's going to be fighting them in the streets? I mean, not the cops. Uh, we already have scandals across Europe. So the cops collaborating with rising Nazi movements. Um, you know, in, in so far as it's going to come down to somebody protecting synagogues and the streets if there's battles it's going to be people well either anarchists like me or people like corbin's followers i mean momentum which is the big you know corbin uh solidarity group within well, not corbin but the movement he represents you know, within the labor party which incidentally was founded by by you know two guys james schneider and john landsman both of whom are jewish is now being represented as somehow an anti-semitic organization where's the only guys who are going to to probably be out there fighting if it comes down to something like all this identity stuff just plays totally into the hands of the right right it does and it also you know it also creates this bitter situation where the groups that suffer under the current economic regime global economic regime disproportionately uh, it harms for example women and people of color and so to the notion that therefore we're going to represent women and people of color by supporting candidates that will maintain the regime that disproportionately harms those groups you know to me it's just it's absolute madness but uh, you know I also want to talk about uh, you know it struck me and then we'll get off the well or actually I just want to move to the movements now because one of my favorite moments in the past political year uh, was when one of the socialist candidates who won a Democratic primary during the debate against her opponent, who was a powerful Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, he asked her, because he assumed he would win, if I win, will you support me? And her answer was, um, I can't answer that because I represent a movement and I had to take a question back to the movement. And I thought, uh, th uh, you, you know, I don't know how that's gone for her since, but that's the kind of politics I want to see. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering to what extent we can get away. You know, uh, you you have a book you co-authored on Kings uh, oh, yeah. re recently. You you have this piece you did years ago on superheroes being inherently conservative figures because they're pr protecting the status quo. Uh, um, to what extent can we get away from kings and superheroes and start thinking about, you know, the climax to Spartacus instead, you know, a movement of people, <laughs> you know, a, a, mo a group of people uh, in solidarity rather than just a hero figure candidate? Yeah, well, that would be nice. I mean, there seems to be the superheroes are coming back. It's kind of significant that, you know, first you have like sci-fi, so the sort of age of Star Trek and utopian visions and, and sci-fi. It wasn't just that, but that was a predominant one. Then we get like sci-fi turns totally dystopian, and then you get rid of sci-fi entirely. It becomes a secondary genre and is largely replaced by these superhero fantasies, which is all about, you know, extraordinary individuals. It's a bizarre kind of Nietzschean world. The thing that really struck me about superheroes is is that, um, that um, incidentally, in writing, sci uh, utopian sci-fi is coming back. Yeah. But it hasn't hit the movies yet, no. Uh, but... Um, yeah, the thing that struck me about about superheroes is they're an imaginative genre. And they're very imaginative, right? But they're an imaginative genre whose ultimate message is suspicion against the imagination because the only really imaginative characters are the bad guys. You know, you identify first with the bad guys. The bad guy's actually trying to do something, and then you kind of feel guilty about it and, and identify the guy beating up the bad guy. It's it's classic sort of Freudian thing going on there. Uh, and many people have talked about that. But what struck me was that, you know, here you have these guys, like, you imagine you're Superman. You could do almost anything. Like, the best thing you can come up to do is fight crime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could be carving cities out of rocks. You could be doing anything. Um, you know, imagine the things you could do if you had, like, see through things. You could fly. You could be you know, super powerful like that. And, and, and these guys have the least imaginative characters ever. Um, but all they can do is, is, is they can be imaginative in terms of their clothes, their cars and their houses, like consumption, basically, right? Whereas the only people who are trying to apply imagination on a political level are, of course, the evil guys. 
So that corresponds very clearly to a classic conservative right-wing ideology. Um, it's anti-fascist, but it's it verges on that. I mean, it's, and I realized when I was writing this that, you know, politics is kind of all about the role of the imagination. Uh, the left is basically people who think the imagination should be unleashed on society and that good things will follow. We can create a better world in a thousand different ways. Whereas conservatism is suspicion of that. If you unleash a human imagination on society, um, try to create your dreams, it'll only lead to death, war, and destruction. And, and of course, fascists are people who agree with the conservatives on that but want to do it anyway. Well, you know, it reminds me of the poem that uh, Diane de Prima wrote in the 60s. One of the lines was, repeating lines, I think, was, there is a war against the imagination. No one can fight it for you. No one can fight it but you. So it is... Oh, thank you for that reference. I didn't realize that was her. I probably got it from her, yeah. Yeah, well, well, well it's, a, it, it's a great point. And to me, in a weird way, what I was thinking when you were talking about it, and then I, I want to maybe close talking about imagination a little bit, but with the superhero, the uh, supervillains being the ones with the real <laughs> imaginations, and often, you know, being the the, the revolutionaries, you know, I mean, you pointed that out about the uh, the uh, Dark Knight movie, and which I also read as you did as a assault on Occupy. Um, he does Occupy Wall Street. I mean. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> but but in others as well, you know, the the creativity and imagination, as you point out, I never thought about it is with the supervillains in a way that may have opened the door for Donald Trump, oddly enough, <laughs> because Trump is the kind of supervillain where, where it's his, kind of a cartoon character, yeah. Yeah, where, where people say, well, you know, Superman hasn't done SHIT for us, so why don't we get, uh, maybe Lex Luthor can do <laughs> something, you know, maybe he yeah. can. Uh, well, He's definitely a cartoon character. I mean, I remember looking at a crowd, like some G8 summit, and there he was, and all these people were trying to shake hands and talk to him. And it was like, it was as if, you know, this badly drawn cartoon character had walked <laughs> into a group of real people. And they all had to pretend he was real. And they're all kind of awkward and <laughs> didn't quite know how to interact with him, you know? Right. And, and, Go ahead. Yeah. It occurred to me that, like, you know, Donald Trump could be imagined as the Bodie McBoat face of American <laughs> politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, right. you're right. It's just like he's just. No, I, I agree. He's basically. First of all, I take it seriously. Ha ha ha. And, 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 you know, basically it's a practical joke played by a certain sector of the electorate on the political class. Because what they're saying is, like, when we see you, we see what you see when you see Donald Trump. You know, right, that's basically right. what they're saying. This is you, greedy, narcissistic, completely, you know, completely corrupt, um, right. lies all the time. But you're all like that. He's just like honest about it. Right. And, you know, it was fascinating for me watching the Republican debates, for example, here in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., where and with sometimes with people who are like working on the Bernie campaign or whatever with me where he was breaking the proscenium in a way, you know, to use the, the theater term, where he would, yeah, it, with his kind of, uh, Marco sweats too much, or, you know, whatever, Jeb is low energy. It was mm. really almost like a, a stepping out, you know, breaking the fourth wall, saying this is all ridiculous, this is all bogus. And mm. I can see how, you know, to use your analogy, he's kind of, you know, a giant sort of trolling tweet in in human <laughs> form, you know, made flesh, made corpulent flesh. And <laughs> this is what I think of you guys. Yeah. Right. Oh, no, it's a it, 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 it's a great insight. So uh, let's talk about the imagination then in the sort of few minutes we have left, several minutes we have left. It seems to me that one of the uplifting things about this moment, as hard as it is to believe that there's anything uplifting about it, is the sort of reflorescence of the imagination of the left. Mm -hmm. And I, I know in interviews you've talked about, and I, I, I always sort of chuckle to myself when I hear the phrase uh, fully automated luxury yeah, communism, you know, or false, fully automated, because it's basically a way of saying, why don't we just let our imaginations open up and figure out yeah. what, what the future ought to look like instead of this, and, and you know, the Marxist uh, educator Paulo Freire in Brazil used to talk about internalizing the oppressor consciousness, or yeah. William Blake, you know, mind forge manacles. Instead of like limiting our imagination, let's think about what the future ought to look like, including with the advent of new technology, but let's think about new social forms. Let's be as inventive with new social forms as we've been with microchips. 
and uh, and see what we can come up with. And I think there's a genuine sort of uh, opening in that field, and I really hope it doesn't get squashed. But what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think absolutely. I think that there's, you know, generations have been robbed of their right to dream of things, of a fundamentally different world. And I think they're in rebellion against that. I mean, you have these people with tools at their uh, at, at their fingertips that they know how to use, which can just you know, completely reimagine worlds, kingdoms, nations, like planets. They could, you know, they could put together anything. Yet they're being told at the same time that you're just not allowed to chain, fundamentally challenge anything of an existing social order that everybody hates and which you know, essentially is there to – to, to condemn them to permanent serfdom, um, <clears throat> death servitude, if nothing else. Um, so so I think that people are just fed up with it. I, this is ridiculous. There's a complete disparity between the means at their disposal and what they're allowed to do with them. Yeah, I think that's very well put. And I was thinking of, you know, Bobby Kennedy had that slogan, um, some see things as they are and ask why I see things as they might be and say, why not? Which, you know, uh, it's not a bad slogan. And I feel like the slogan for the past 50 years has been, you know, I see things as they are and, and think, well, that's the best you're ever going to get. And mm -hmm. there's no reason to do that. And so, you know, I guess I guess I enjoy things like fully automated luxury communism because one it's a bold act of the imagination two it's a sort of finger shaking in the face of you know consensus exactly. driven thinking and like is why not now, as a, yeah. <laughs> what's that yeah communism is like the new it's like queer you know let's take it up and throw it back at them right no i think that's a, a, exactly right and, and unfortunately we're going to run out of time because uh, there was well, a lot more I would have loved to talk to you about, including... Well, I guess we'll just have to continue this at some point. We'll have to do it again, yeah, because I really want to talk about your piece on the uh, agricultural revolution. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm working on that right now. Um, sure, let's do that. All right, so unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there, but but I really enjoyed the discussion as I always do. So David Graeber, anthropologist, author of uh, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, and Bullshit jobs of theory. Uh, as always, great to talk to you and thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure. Take care.